If I were to ask you this morning, what two important things someone could do to grow in their relationship with Christ, I wonder what you would say. If you could narrow it down, there are lots of things that are important, right? Lots of things that are uh, part of how we grow in our relationship with Christ. But if you could narrow them down to two, what would you say? I think most people would say something along the lines of, you need to read the Bible or, or hear the Bible read or taught and explained, and you need to pray giving attention to God's Word, listening to God's Word, and then communicating to God in prayer are two of the most important things that we can do to grow in our relationship with Christ. Now, Daniel, we have seen in our study of the book of Daniel, was clearly a man of prayer. Right? We saw that in particular in Daniel chapter 6, where he ended up in the lion's den because through a, a plot of some leaders against him, there had been a law put into effect where nobody could pray to anyone except the king for 30 days. And Daniel defied the law. He did just what he had always done. He prayed to the one true and living God three times a day. And that's why he was cast into the lion's den. And God, of course, delivered him. So we've seen that Daniel is a man of prayer. But now in chapter 9, we also see that Daniel was a man of God's Word. And that doesn't surprise us because we've seen from the very beginning of the book that Daniel has been faithful to God despite extremely trying and challenging circumstances. From the time he was brought from his country, right, in Judah, and he was brought into exile in Babylon and was set to be trained up to serve in the king's court, despite the fact that he was in a foreign land, despite the fact that he was at the mercy of a pagan king, he requested not to defile himself with the king's food, but to have a special diet prepared for him so that he could continue to honor the Lord. And throughout the book of Daniel, we have seen that he has remained faithful to God despite living in a country surrounded by people who don't worship the same God as him, but who worship foreign gods, pagan gods, idolatrous gods. So it doesn't surprise us to find that Daniel was a man who gave particular attention to God's word, but it is interesting and insightful and helpful to see what Daniel tells us about how he listened to God's Word, what he learned from God's Word, and then how he responded to what he read. So in the sermon this morning, we're only going to focus on the first 19 verses of Daniel chapter 9. There's no way we could get through this entire chapter, and we'll probably be pushing it to get through these 19 verses. But it, we need to, to start with the context of Daniel's Bible study, as it were. He tells us in verse 1 that it was the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, who by descent was a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. And that's a mouthful and a lot of names that we don't encounter on a, on a regular basis. So what is he talking about? What he's telling us is this took place when the Medo-Persian Empire had conquered the Babylonian Empire, and so now Darius is king, and scholars tell us that happened around 539 B.C. Now that's significant because Daniel, scholars also tell us, was taken into exile back in chapter 1 in 605 B.C., which means Daniel's been in Babylon for about 66 years, almost 70 years. And that's significant because of what Daniel discovered when he was reading the words of Jeremiah the prophet. Notice in verse 2, he says it was during Darius' reign, the first year of his reign, that Daniel perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So remember, the Jews have been taken into exile. Their temple has been destroyed. 
Jerusalem has been laid waste. And Daniel says, during the first year of Darius' reign, so after Babylon had been you know, conquered, I was reading the words of Jeremiah the prophet, the words that God spoke to Jeremiah, revealed to Jeremiah. And as I was reading those words, I saw what God said about how long this desolation that had come upon Jerusalem was going to last. And, and Jeremiah was told it was going to last 70 years. Now that gets Daniel's attention because it's been almost 70 years since all this started. So Daniel recognizes that the end of this exile, the end of this desolation may be drawing near. Now if you're like me, it's not enough just to read and hear that Daniel was reading Jeremiah and Jeremiah said it's only going to last 70 years. I want to know what part of Jeremiah he was reading. I want to know where he saw that, where he heard that. I want to see that with my own eyes, hear that with my own ears. And thankfully, it's not hard to find. In Jeremiah chapter 25, and you don't have to turn there, but you know, if you want to jot down a note or something, in Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah tells us uh, why the exile, why, why the punishment had come upon Jerusalem and how long it's going to last and, and how that's going to look. And, and that chapter begins this way. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, that opening line from Jeremiah in that chapter is significant because that puts us at virtually the exact same place as Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. So Jeremiah is speaking this at basically the same time that Daniel and his friends are being carried away into Babylon. And uh, after Jeremiah recounts how Israel has refused to listen to the prophets, refused to listen to God, They've sinned against the Lord. He says this. He says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then, after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. And he goes on. So Jeremiah says, at about the time that Daniel is being taken into exile, he says, here's why this is happening. God is in control. It's not that the Babylonians have stronger gods than our God. Our God is the only true God. But God is allowing the Babylonians to do this to us because we have not been faithful to God, because we have sinned against him, we have broken our covenant with him, and that's why this is happening. And this is going to last for 70 years, and then Babylon is going to be judged too, because Babylon also has iniquities. They also have their sins that they must be judged for. So Daniel reads this prophecy, he encounters these words of Jeremiah, recognizes that the time for the end of this exile and period of judgment is drawing near. And so what does he do? He responds in prayer. Uh, he studies the Bible. He listens to what God says. And then he does not presume to just sort of sit back and say, okay, well, God said 70 years later, it'll all be fine. I'll just wait and watch and see. Daniel goes to God in prayer knowing that God's word is always intended to provoke from us a response. Whether that response is repentance for sin or thanksgiving for blessings or a desire to draw nearer to God or whatever, God's word to us is always meant to provoke not apathy, not indifference, but an active 
response, even if that response is simply to be still and know that he is God, as the psalmist says. So Daniel gives attention to God's word, gives attention to this revelation, and responds in prayer. Now, there's something else significant about this that I want us to think about for a moment. So far in the book of Daniel, most of what God has revealed to Daniel has been through what we would call extremely dramatic means. Right? Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that Daniel interprets. Daniel himself has visions that uh, God gives an angel to interpret for Daniel as he is revealed to him what's going to happen in the future. Daniel, having encountered all those dramatic revelations, those dreams and visions, does not then despise a revelation that comes through the more ordinary means of Scripture. He doesn't say, I don't have time for for reading Jeremiah. I'm waiting for a vision. I'm waiting for a a sign in the heavens. Daniel's had those kind of revelations, right? But those are not the only kind of revelations that matter, and they don't supersede what God has revealed in Scripture, even though, by comparison, Scripture might seem like a very ordinary thing. It is nonetheless God himself speaking to us. And that is no small thing. So Daniel gives attention to God's word, and then he responds to God's word again with prayer. Verse 3, he says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. He's humbling himself before God, and he's asking God for mercy He's confessing sin, as he will say later, the sin, his sin and the sin of his people. Right? He's coming before God to acknowledge what Israel has done, what he has done, and to ask God to do for them better things than what they deserve. Right? That's what mercy means. So he comes before God and Again, this is a particular response to a particular situation. This is not always the way we're going to respond because sometimes we're responding to blessings. Sometimes we're responding to encouragement. Sometimes we're responding to promises and and grace and the gospel. But here, Daniel is responding to something that has brought conviction, right? To something that has reminded him of the sins of his people and his own sins. And so when When we encounter something in the Bible like that, something that reminds us we've fallen short of the glory of God, we have sinned against the Lord, we've done something wrong, right? Daniel gives us a model here, a pattern here of how we can respond. And it begins with humble prayer, right? Prayer that acknowledges our sin, prayer that acknowledges who God is. In verse 4, he says, I pray to the Lord my God and make confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. It's important for us to begin with a right understanding of who God is. Not going to rightly confess our sin or rightly praise God unless we are thinking rightly about God himself about his character, his nature, that he's unchanging, that he's faithful, that he's just, and he's merciful. So Daniel begins by praising God for who he is, and then he begins confessing what he and his people have done. In verse 5, he says, We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. He doesn't mince words. He does not pass the blame. He does not try to sort of smooth things over. Well, it wasn't that bad. I mean, it wasn't great, you know, but it wasn't that, no. He just says, we rebelled, we turned aside, we acted wickedly, we sinned, we were wrong. He goes on in verse 6, We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. We just didn't listen. It wasn't that you didn't speak. You spoke. You sent your prophets. And and they told everybody what you wanted us to do. But we didn't listen. 
Again, notice that Daniel does not pass the blame. This is not like when Adam and Eve encountered God in the Garden of Eden after their sin, after their fall, and God says, what happened? And they say, well, here's what I did, but it was also partly her fault, or partly his fault, or partly your fault. Daniel just says, it's our fault. Not trying to shift the blame, not trying to smooth it over, just being honest and making a true and full confession. This is what we did. All right? And then he makes clear who does deserve the blame. Since he's not shifting the blame, he says in verse 7, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. Verse 8, To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. A little bit later, Because we have sinned against you. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Right, it's not your fault, God. You were righteous. You're not at fault. You are not to blame. Uh, we can't say the reason we sinned is because we didn't know, or you didn't tell us, or you weren't clear enough, or you didn't give us enough opportunities. There's nothing about this that I can put off on you. You are righteous. We were sinful. You have done right. You are vindicated. We are the ones who deserve the public humiliation, the shame, the disaster that has come upon our nation in this exile as a result of our sin. We deserve the blame, Daniel says. And then he also says that all this has happened just like God told them it would way back in the law of Moses. So notice verse 11, he says, All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. So here's another way that we know that Daniel has been paying attention to God's word. He looks out, uh, out on the exile when he thinks back on the 66 years that he has experienced in Babylon and thinks back on what it was like to be taken from his homeland into this foreign and pagan country, he does not ask himself, why did this happen? He does not say, I don't understand how God could allow this. He says, I know exactly why this happened. I know exactly why God allowed this. He told us hundreds and hundreds of years ago through Moses that if we didn't keep his law, that if we worshiped other gods, if we turned away from him, this is exactly what would happen. And he has simply done what he warned us he would do. The curses for disobedience that, that Daniel's talking about are found in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 28. And they say things like this. God says, if in spite of this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. And I will lay your cities waste, and will make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your pleasing aromas, that is, their sacrifices, and I myself will devastate the land, so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled at it, and I will scatter you among the nations. And I will unsheathe the sword after you, and your land shall be a desolation, and your cities shall be a waste. Then a little later he says, But if they confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them, and brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled, and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. That's exactly what Daniel is doing. Daniel knows what God has said. He knows the response that God has required. He knows why Israel has been sent into exile, and he knows what it will take for God to bring them back. They have to humble themselves, they have to repent, they have to turn from their sin, they have to turn back to the Lord, and then God will act, just as he said he would. Daniel knows what the Bible says, and knowing what the Bible says 
helps us pray and act biblically. It's hard to know what to pray if you don't know who God is or what God has said He will do. It's hard to know how to respond to what situ- whatever situation you're in if you don't know what God has said about how He will act in those situations or how He wants you to respond to those situations. That's one of the reasons why we need to give regular attention to God's Word so that we know more who He is, so that we know more how He wants us to pray, so that we know more how He wants us to respond. Daniel recognizes the problem in verse 13 when he says, as it is written in the law of Moses, again, referring back to those curses for disobedience, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. The problem is, in other words, Daniel's saying, we've come into this exile because we violated God's covenant, and this is what he told us would happen, but he also told us that we needed to repent and turn back to him when that happened, and we've been in exile for 66 years, and we haven't done it. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to turn back to the Lord. I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to confess Israel's sin. And remember, Daniel is arguably one of the most faithful Jews alive at this time. It's not like Daniel has been worshiping idols the whole time he's been in Babylon. I remember his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. Daniel has been faithful, but he's not perfect, just like nobody else is. He's not above, except for Jesus, right? He's not above confessing his sin. He's not above turning to the Lord and saying, I'm guilty. My people are guilty, and I'm guilty. God, we have turned from you, we have sinned against you, and we need your mercy. So that's what he does. That's what he says in his prayer. Verse 14 and 15, he says, Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. Again, he's not shifting the blame. It's our fault, not God's fault. And now, verse 15, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as at this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. When we become aware of our sin, this is how we are supposed to respond. This is how the Christian life begins at conversion, when for the first time you're really convicted of your sin, you recognize you're a sinner before God, and you turn to God, you recognize there's only one way to be saved, that only through Jesus' death and resurrection can your sins be blotted out and you be restored to a right relationship, to true fellowship with God. And you call out to God and you say, I'm a sinner, I need you to forgive me. That's where it starts. But it doesn't end there. Right? Throughout our life as Christians, we must go again and again and again to the Lord and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me. Right? That's why it's so wonderful and glorious that God promised in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't do any good to try to hide our sin from God. He's not like, you know, a parent or a teacher or a boss or somebody that we try to sort of wiggle our way out of trouble, try to make excuses, try to shift the blame, hope that they don't really see and know what happened so we can get away with it. God sees through all of that. He knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything about us. It does no good to try to hide our sin. The only thing that we can do that makes any sense is to come clean. And the Bible says when we come clean, we get made clean. When we confess our sin, He removes our sin from us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now, Daniel doesn't just confess his sin and Israel's sin. He asks God to act. He asks God to respond. He asks God 
to do something. His response, again, is not presumption, right? But humble petition. He does not just sit back and say, okay, 70 years, we're almost there. Great. Because if Israel doesn't repent, God could say, okay, how about another 70 years, this time in Persia instead of Babylon? Nothing to prevent God from doing that. Jeremiah talks about this as well. In Jeremiah 18, he says, If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. So if you say, well, God said 70 years, so he has to do it. Well, no, not if they don't repent. That was part of the deal. And if they continue to be unrepentant and, and disobedient and sinful, God can say, okay, well, never mind. I said I would restore you and build you up, but now because you're sinning, we're going to do it this way instead. Right? So Daniel does not presume. He asks God to act. He asks God to remove his wrath. Verse 16, he says, O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. It's not because Babylon was mighty that Jerusalem has been destroyed. It's because we've sinned. It's because your wrath has been poured out on us. And I'm asking you, God, to bring an end to that. Let your wrath turn away. He asks based not on Israel's righteousness, but on God's mercy. Right, verse 17, he says, Now therefore, O Lord, our, our, o, o our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. Verse 18, O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Remember the parable Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax collector? And they both went up to the temple to pray, and the Pharisees stood up and prayed and said, Oh, God, I'm so glad I'm not like all those horrible sinners out there. I'm not like that tax collector. I do all the things I'm supposed to do. I keep the law, I tithe, you know, whatever all things he mentioned to the Lord. Here's all the reasons why I'm great. But the tax collector humbled himself, beat his chest, wouldn't even look up and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said it was the tax collector, not the Pharisee, who went home justified, who went home righteous in God's sight. Daniel is responding just like the tax collector. He's not like the Pharisee. He doesn't say, God, we're your holy people. We're really great. Why are you letting these things happen to us? You ought to fix this. We're really important. No. No, he says, we've, we've blown it, we've sinned, we've messed up, we've done wrong, we've acted wickedly, so we're not asking for these things based on what we've done, on our righteousness. But we know that you're a merciful God, and we need your mercy. Please pour out on us your mercy. He asks God to act. He's not afraid to ask for a decisive response to his prayer. Look at verse 19. He says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not. Don't wait. Do this now. Forgive us now. He, like Hebrews talks about, he approaches the throne of God with boldness, as we are told to do. And he asks God to act for his own sake, for his own glory, there at the end of verse 19. For your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. You have associated yourself with us. And we have dishonored your name. But I'm asking you to act 
for the honor of your name. Restore Jerusalem, restore your people, because when other nations look at Jerusalem and look at what has happened to us, they think their God was weak, or their God abandoned them, or their God wasn't able to conquer Babylon or whatever. Daniel knows that's not true. So he says, God, restore us. God, restore Jerusalem so that people will see that you are the true and living God, that you are faithful to your covenant, that it was our fault and not your fault that Jerusalem fell and that we were carried into exile, that you were in charge of all of that and that your name is good and righteous and holy and worthy of worship. Now, it is not very often that your Bible study will reveal something as imminent as the end of a 70-year exile, right? We can't can't expect that every time you sit down and study the Bible, it's going to be like Daniel 9, and you're just going to see something that's going to happen any day now, any moment now, any year now. But the pattern that we see here in Daniel 9, the pattern of God's revelation and our response is something that should characterize all of our lives, something that does characterize our worship. We gather to worship the Lord, and we hear His Word read, we hear His Word explained, and we respond in prayer, and we respond in song, and we say, God, you're great, and we say, God, we are sorry, and we say, God, have mercy, and we say, God, we praise you because you've been gracious and faithful, though we have not. And then all throughout the week, we open our Bible, we read a psalm, a passage from a gospel, a letter, whatever, and we're reminded again who God is and what reason we have to give thanks and what reason we have to confess our sin and what reason we have to trust Him. This is the pattern of the Christian life. Listen to God. Respond to God because we trust God. Let's pray.